Welcome to Retirementals, a podcast that dives headfirst into the issues facing the financial sector at the intersection of investment, technology and financial advice. Hosted by Abraham Oksanya, you can expect raw honesty, critical analysis and energetic interviews. Here is your host, Abraham Okasanya. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are, and welcome to the Retirementor Podcast. Um, it's great to have you here on the podcast. My guest today will be known to many of you if you're a financial advisor, financial planner in this, uh, in this great professional of ours. You'll be very familiar with Roderick Renison, who is the partner at Catalyst. Uh, she is an M&A consultant to financial advisors and wealth managers. Uh, Roderick, welcome to Retirementals. Thank you. Good to be here. So, Roderick, assuming there's anyone on the podcast or listening to the podcast today who's been living under the rock for the past uh, you know, decade or so, give us a little bit of an introduction to, to yourself, and and what you do. Okay, um, well, um, I have to admit that uh, I have been in financial services, first of all, all my working life and for a very long time. If we said over 40 years and slightly less than 50 <laughs> years, that would be about right. Um, That's been far so, longer um, than I've been on the planet. <laughs> well, that will be the case for many of the people looking or listening to this. Um, and I've had a wonderful and varied uh, career. Um, I started off uh, when I left school um, looking for a holiday job and I landed up uh, after being tutored by two actors for uh, two, three days, learning a script, selling life insurance door to door uh, in Hounslow West. And um, I, uh, well, some would say I've never uh, progressed forward from there, but um, in all seriousness, I um, uh, have had a varied number of roles. I, I worked for Barclays Bank in their insurance services uh, division called Bisco in the 1970s, which some very ancient people remember. Uh, everybody who's done as long in financial services as I did ha has to work for the Prudential. So I worked for Vambra, the forerunner to Prue or Prue Hoven in the broker division uh, in the mid 1980s. I then worked for an accountancy firm called Robson Rhodes, which is now part of Grant Thornton, and became a principal and then partner. I was there for 10 years until uh, the late 1990s. And then I um, went off to have my uh, tour in uh, fund management. I went to work for Mercury Asset Management that became part of Merrill's um, and joined their subsidiary life insurance and unit trust companies. And then I got headhunted for the only time in my life in 1998 and went to work for. Bradford and Bingley. Um, in fact, it was 2000 at that point. And um, I had wonderful uh, four or five years there. Um, and um, I then had a complete further change and I became the late Simon Chamberlain's chief operating officer in Think, the predecessor to succession. And we built the business from 25 to 756 uh, advisors across a range of divisions and uh, there were 32 acquisitions after we merged with a business called Destiny. And um, uh, we uh, then sold to AXA in 2006 and I remained until 2008 and I then left corporate life and since then I've been doing a mixture of uh, consultancy, non-exec um, and uh, the occasional bit of interim. So, for example, I was the Nationwide Building Society's RDR subject matter expert between 2010 and 2012. And um, I now spend my time uh, with uh, a gradually reducing number of uh, non-exec roles, chair roles, and uh, I've also got a vice chair of a multi-academy trust in North London. Uh, but the vast majority of my time is now spent very happily involved in M&A, working with intermediaries and helping them with their succession. That's incredible. You've had an illustrious career in financial services. I think there's only one question left and we can answer and we can end this podcast, which is, who haven't you worked for? <laughs> well, I don't think it's as bad as that. I mean, I think, um, you know, I've been I've been with a variety of people, but I've done, you know, a couple of stints, stints of 10 or 11 years in places um, as well as shorter periods, um, you know. Sometimes circumstances dictate, sometimes it's personal preference. Um, 
and um, you know that's that's just a fact of life. Uh, you know, in in uh, I suppose our parents' generation, you might have started working for a company, joined a final salary scheme, and stayed until you were sixty or sixty-five. But that really isn't much of an option anymore, you know. Um, and um, you know, uh, some of the roles I've enjoyed more than others is all I will say. But um, you know, I've been very lucky to have such a variety and so many people who are prepared to tolerate employing me or working with me. So I've been very, very lucky. Well, you you fared much, much better than I did, and uh, and I would ever do. <laughs> I'm I'm completely unemployable or, or unemployable is the word. So. Uh, but you know now you're 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 doing your own thing right with with um with um catalyst partners or catalysts so tell us a little bit about that you are are you advising the the advisors the ifa firm selling uh to we'll come back to who they're selling to or are you on the buy side of the thing or, or are you it's 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 a really good question um one of the things that I and my three partners, John Chapman, Martin Laverick and Andy Culling, all passionately believe in is acting for the vendor. So we want to be acting for and working with uh, the person who is wanting to manage their succession. You know, whether that's a sale, a management buyout and on some fewer occasions, an employee ownership trust or maybe some form of family succession. And. It's a really good point. The reason the four of us are together is we all passionately believe in the same values, one of which is, first of all, act for the client. Secondly, we all have run financial planning firms. And three out of the four of us started our lives in financial advice. The odd person out, not that he's odd, I hasten to add, is John Chapman, who started his life and is still a chartered accountant. And um, so what we think we bring is four experienced wise heads and we work in pairs that's one of our other principles we don't ever work alone with a client there's always two partners that every client gets so what we aim to do is offer you know it's um, said by others but we believe we deliver it which is a personalized service for in uh, for um, the principles of, of firms um, who are considering their future in whatever shape form or size that takes i mean sometimes it's more uh, challenging. I mean, it can be a boardroom fallout. Sometimes it's sort of working out, you know, how you split the firm. Sometimes, you know, it, it can arise from a number of instances, but essentially we're here to find solutions to what people want to do with their future. And, you know, the age range varies. Um, we uh, worked with people in their early 40s, uh, by exception, who are looking to sell and um, carry on in financial services but don't want the responsibility and we're working with people in their late 70s who just are so addicted but haven't been able to give it up but sometimes you know some event comes along whether it's uh, ill health or something else and it's just a trigger point and uh, but the average age of principles that we work with are typically between late 40s and uh, late 60s but those in their late 40s tend to want to stay on in some shape form or size not retire so Again, you know, it's not a one size fits all. It's very much what does each individual person want to do? So, you know, we like to spend half a day with people just getting to know them and see whether they like us, we like them. And sometimes, you know, they may want to work with us, but we just don't think we can help. It's a, it's a two way street. You know, we're going to be with them for over a year on average. And sometimes it's, you know, some of our longer standing clients in various circumstances we've been working with for three years, you know, because of various just how things have gone. Fascinating. So, so you, you, in your earlier uh, answer to my to my question, you sort of threw out, you know, these different exit option or succession planning options. Um, but for for the layman like me who doesn't understand what these things mean, so can you go through each of these options that you see for people? Um, wanting advisors wanting to exit their, their, their business or you know of course of course um, please and, and explain I, them yes I, the order in which i tend to look at it is first of all is there a possibility of family succession do you have a son daughters by exception sometimes 
you know, nephews or nieces uh, in the business or people who want to come into the business. Um, and sometimes that's a possibility. Um, and that brings with it its own challenges in terms of how you fund it um, over a period of time. Uh, you talk, you know, there's often talk about people who are farmers, uh, you know, if you're in financial planning and they're the worst, they keep promising the business to their son, typically, and sometimes their daughters now, but actually they never get around to handing over. So, you know, that's managing sort of people and relationships. So that's one area. Another will be that where business owners are particularly keen to maintain the legacy of their business and not see it subsumed by a larger consolidator, they may want to look at a management buyer and they feel they owe it to um, their um, next generation. But that presupposes that the next generation are A, ready and willing to take over and take on debt in order to buy into the business. Or maybe it's a vendor initiated management buyout where the vendor helps arrange the debt. Um, or sometimes it's a variant of that. Uh, following the legislation in 2014-15 with the uh, Conservative Lib Dem coalition, we have employee ownership trusts, EOPS for short. And that's another means of handing over to potentially all of the employees in the firm, albeit you've got a certain limited number who run. And again, you make the assumption, but with a management buyout and with an EOT, there is likely to be, uh, in fact, nearly certainly going to be a longer period over which the transition takes place and the owner is going to have to be patient and put effort into it. Um, and for many people, um, those options just when they've looked at it don't really quite work. So a sale is what they finally land up doing. But a sale isn't just a one size fits all. It's not a it works like this and there's no other choice. So a sale could be they decide to sell, retire and hand over to the new owner straight away. It could be that actually they stay on. It could be they only sell a percentage and actually stay on to run their business as a unit within a larger business while sharing in future gains and profits. It could be they take some of the proceeds as what's called paper, in other words, shares in the new owner's business. Um, there's all sorts of variants. So even when they've decided to sell, there's a number of subcategories to work through in terms of what they like. So what we do um, is we spend time with the owners, the principals, asking what their preferences are. So, you know, we call them, I call them red lines, gray lines and white lines. Uh, what absolutely is vital, must have or mustn't have or don't want. What would I like to have and what would be nice to have? And it's only when we've got down to that particular degree of detail that we know whether we can help and whether what their aspirations are are realistic. But it's like so many things. The more effort you put in at the outset to understand what it is that the um, client wants, in this case, the intermediary firm principal or principals who are looking uh, to uh, manage their succession, the better, uh, well, the more likely it is you're going to get a good outcome. Yes, no, this is fascinating. So, so let's take an example where there is a natural successor in, successor in the business, right? Regardless of whether it's a family member, you know, a son, a daughter, or indeed a younger I use the wrong phrase, maybe a younger girl or guy that you brought into the business. Essentially, what's happening there is the founder is saying, right, I'm going to sell this business to you. They're going to agree evaluation and it's either going to be funded by debt or, you know, debt to the to the to the founder, to the owner of the firm, which we paid over a number of years or an external debt funded by, um, you know, a third party bank, maybe not, but finance houses. That's essentially what it is, no? Uh, am I getting this completely wrong? You're right, except in the case of an EOT, it might be funded um, out of profits over a fairly lengthy period. I mean, typically that period could be seven or 10 years. So for example, um, I know of a business um, in one of uh, quite near London where 
the three shareholders who are in their late 50s to early 60s are wanting to set up an employee ownership trust. They're currently doing an evaluation and they accept that in the most uh, in the oldest of the three um, shareholders case, he won't see finally his money until he's 73 or 74. And that's yeah. a conscious decision they've taken. And they're confident that they have in place the next generation of management that's competent enough and experienced enough to act as trustees and be responsible for that side of the business. Because, I mean, they've got to sell 51% to qualify. There's a series of other qualification factors. Um, and sometimes after reflection, whether it's a management buyout or an EOT, it the numbers don't work or actually the people who are being given the opportunity say, well, it's really kind of you, but actually I don't fancy the responsibility. I mean, to give you an example, we had one down in the West Country about a year ago where he said to his four advisors, look, here it is. And only one of the four was interested. So he subsequently sold, but carved out a portion of the proceeds for his uh, advisors. And so they still got something out of it. But, um, you know, they'd been given the opportunity, but had turned it down. So the point I wanted to make is that, you know, management buyout, buyout, buyout or, or is a sale to uh, call it an internal sale to, to a team member or a family member. I understand that. I, I get that. This employee ownership trust thing is one that I am least knowledgeable or more ignorant about, let's say. And so essentially you create a trust that owns the business and the, the trust is the employees within the company. And you say they have to, the trust has to buy uh, at least 50% of the company or less. No, they have to buy 51, they have to buy 50, you, you have to, if you look at it in reverse, um, Abraham, they have to, the owners have to sell at least 51%, but they can retain the rest for whatever period they mutually agree. Um, but obviously, the more they buy and the more valuable the business is, the more the financial strain is uh, on the business. Right. But, you know, there are specialist lawyers to take you through it. Um, and, you know, there are people who are passionate about employee ownership trusts who really understand them. I mean, the leading intermediary practitioner is a guy called Chris Budd at, um, you know, the eternal business. And he runs courses for people who are serious about doing it. And I talk to him, you know, from time to time. And, uh, you know, it, it, if you're minded to do it, it's a long road, but some evaluations work out and it works. You know, you've also got to look at the number of employees you've got. You've got to, uh, there are certain qualification rules about that. If you've got too few employees and too many directors, you, you fail another rule. But generally, um, if you're minded to want to preserve your business, you're passionate about keeping it, you're passionate about developing your uh, next generation, albeit everybody in the business, you know, is, 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 is effectively you know, able to be part of it, albeit you'll have a, a senior group that run the, the, the business. Then it's great. But I think that and for management buyouts, it's a case of planning early. And, you know, it's not always the case that you plan early, but I mean, if you're, say, I make it up 50 and you've got a 10 year stretch, then it's great. If on the other hand, you're 65 and you wake up one morning and say, I think I really want to get out, it's a bit different. You still can do it, but you're just probably be waiting until you're 73, 74 to see all of your money. And so it, it, it really is a case of planning. It's a case of planning. Yeah, indeed. I mean, all of these things about planning. And I'm having, I'm having a number of conversations, um, you know, future pod, podcast guests, at least one, who's gone through this journey that I want to, I want to uh, sort of unpack the, the journey with. But the, the thing that always gets me is that a business needs entrepreneurial drive, right? And I'm sitting here thinking, if you have, in the case that you're selling to managers of the business or successors of the, successors of the business, they own the business, there is equity ownership, there is that sense of responsibility to drive the business forward. 
The thing that always puzzles me about, uh, you know, employee ownership trust is that then you say the employee collectively own this business, but in actual fact, they don't, right? Because, because you know, they get dividends from this business, right? You know, the first 10 years, maybe less, right, is much of the dividends is used to pay the ex-owners. And that presumes that these people are going to stay in the business for the long run. They're going to have, and why should they have the drive to take on the risk, to take on, to drive the business forward uh, and to stay? When in actual fact, when they do leave the business as an individual, they go with nothing, you know. I, I don't understand this. Is this, it doesn't seem aligned with this, the entrepreneurial spirit that you need to drive businesses forward. Yeah, I mean, you know, Chris, somebody like Chris Bud would be a greater expert than I would, but in my experience, it works really well where the owner has had a very inclusive culture where people want to stay, where people want to be developed, people are paid well. I mean, there are tax breaks. You can pay a certain amount free of tax on an EOS as well. And, you know, you can create incentives for people within uh, the employee ownership trust to get them to stay. But where it works really well is where, let's just hype, hypothetical example, where you've got the next generation who've been groomed over a period of time they're as passionate about the values of the business as the owner is and they've developed the wish and they've got the skill sets to manage the business and they're actually at a point where they're saying we can do this you know they're typically people in their maybe 30s 40s and they're saying to the owner we really respect you but actually yes it would be great if you gradually faded out and left us to it and i think that's what somebody like chris budd would have found and then you know another if you like, poster boy in employee ownership trust terms is Barry Horner at Paradigm Norwood, which is probably the best known one. And, uh, you know, he's still very much there and part of the business, but they've been really, really keen to, um, uh, you know, to develop the business uh, alongside him. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I should probably speak to Chris and Barry and and and. Uh, dissuade myself of my ignorance. <laughs> uh, well, but, uh, uh, the, the the answer is, you know, it, it, the, the old-fashioned phrase, it's different strokes for different folks. Mm -hmm. And all I'm saying is that succession is a, a, is a, is a process of evaluating different options. It's not automatically a knee-jerk reaction saying, I'm selling, is all I'm saying to a third party. And... But 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 uh, I, having said that, I'd say over eighty percent of conversations we have finish with the option of selling, and then it's the question of in what way do I sell, and what is the structure of the sale. So so let's talk about that, and that's your natural sort of area of expertise. When the the owner has gone through this option and they've decided they're going to sell to an external buyer. And as you, you've been talking about, I've listened to, to, to a couple of your recent presentations, which are fantastic, by the way. There's been a deluge of private equity um, money coming into our space. Can you shed the light on, on what's actually going on there? You know, how many P backed consolidators are there? Can you put them in different ca category, uh, you know? Yeah, very happy to. Very good question. Um, the answer is that we think at the moment, uh, and it's John Chapman, the accountant, as you will not doubt, um, who keeps the stats for this, but we think there are close on 160 potential buyers in the market. If you count a buyer as someone who's a, either bought one or more businesses in the last five years or has expressed an interest in doing so. Of that, there's probably, I don't know, 45, 50 that are active. And of that, 35 are, 36 maybe by now, are private equity backed. And of the 36, about 24 are backed by US or North American private equity. 
Why does private equity find it so attractive? Well, they find it attractive because they perceive the UK to be a well-managed regulatory environment with sticky income. Um, and cynically, since 2013-14, when the interest of private equity began to grow in financial planning firms and employee benefit businesses and uh, wealth management businesses, it's because they can't find anywhere that's more interesting to invest in. And thus, uh, you know, we've seen an enormous amount of uh, expansion in terms of numbers of private equity backed businesses. And that in turn has created competition in terms of valuations going up. And that has made it more attractive for some intermediaries who five years ago might not have decided to sell to sell because it's the, the terms have been so attractive. So the, and the other reason for North American firms is that the returns in the UK putting money to use are better than they are in the States in terms of the multiples. And then, of course, you've got the issue uh, of, at the moment, um, the dollar versus the pound. But then against that at the moment, you've got rising interest rates. So the cost of debt is going up because private equity doesn't invest usually all equity. It's equity plus debt. You know, and typically it might be, I don't know, 20, 30 percent equity and 70 percent whatever, or maybe it's 50, 50, whatever. You know, the combination is of debt and debt is costing more than it did. So that will have some impact on slowing some potential new entrants coming into the market, probably. but there is nevertheless a significant amount of choice and there is no sign that for you know substantial um attractive intermediary businesses there is any diminution in uh, appetite from private equity backed businesses a none that we've found anyway that's so that's that's an overview i mean i don't know whether that answers all of the question but i i've, I've sort of attempted to do so reasonably i hope succinctly it does. You've done a brilliant job. And uh, including answering the ones that I, I wanted to an answer, ask as follow on, which is this issue about debt versus equity. So the idea is that, you know, if they're putting in, say, I don't know, uh, you know, 25 million uh, in, in a business, in a consolidator, then they will be borrowing, um, you know, 75 you know, roughly speaking, and then that means the firm has a work chest of a hundred million to go off and, and buy out firms. Can you put these consolidators in or these buyers in groups? You know, would you say there are vertical integrated models? There are, or, or am I? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I well, I, you can try and categorize that way. I, I tend to categorize slightly differently in terms of saying there are shades and variations of private equity. I mean, there are those that are really there wanting to accumulate assets. So they're, you know, aggregators of assets as opposed to even consolidators. And we prefer people who actually are interested in financial planning firms and actually invest in them as opposed to just try and cut all the costs and maximize the profits. And to that extent, there are variants, we think, amongst the private equity houses in terms of how they think and operate, you know, taking a longer term view. They may not be there themselves, but they're looking to build something longer term. And then there are also variants, as I know, through my non-exec roles um, that I've had, um, albeit fewer now, um, that there are some more hands on private equity who are some would say even meddlesome, and others who are relatively more hands off. But no private equity house is hands off when the numbers aren't going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a bit like, you know, when you come to want to sell your business as an intermediary, you need to do real due diligence on the buyers that you're being presented with through someone like Catalyst. And we help our clients do reverse due diligence in terms of looking at the firm, uh, looking at the PE house, looking at various facets, looking at the firm that's got the funds to buy them and so on. But it, 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 but it does behove, to use an old fashioned word, but it does, it is vital that if you're looking with a management team to get private equity money that you 
know what sort of private equity house you're getting into bed with. So, for example, yes. is it a requirement that you get so much money out into the market for acquisitions within a time period or is there less of a requirement to do that because that drives certain behaviors um, and i think in the same way as you look back as a seller on the sale that you did and some people will be happy with what they did and some people will be less happy i suspect if you were to ask them privately some senior management teams of uh, consolidate uh, of PE back businesses would be with the benefit of hindsight slightly less happy with certain PE houses yeah. they've had than others um, but that's down to them to do their own due diligence you know in a competitive environment because most consolidators will normally be able to get potential terms from two or three private equity I mean if you take one business that needs to remain nameless um, I mean they had when they went to look at least seven or eight looking. And so they had a lot of choice and you know they made their choice. And of course, the backing doesn't necessarily need to be private equity. It might be a fund management business that supports you, uh, as in the case of Schroeder's and Benchmark. It might be that you get funding for your next phase from a provider like Aviva and Succession, you know, where they um, Aviva took out um, inflection capital. So, Again, there are variants in the market. And although we talk a lot about PE, there is PE back business. There are inter regional intermediaries who make a small number of uh, acquisitions using their own internal funds and maybe some bank borrowing. There are family offices. There are providers. You know, there are um, fund management groups. So there is, the, there is a variety in the market and they all have their attributes and their features. And part of what we do is to bring those to clients and provide where we can as much choice as possible so they can see the possibilities before they make their minds up. Yeah, th this is fascinating, actually. I, I think you almost sort of break the source of capital into groups. So where the assets, sorry, where the source of capital is coming from, say, a provider um, or asset, you know, a provider or a platform or asset management groups. Essentially, am I right to think that essentially what they want is to think of the advice firm as a distribution channel, right? So their reward, their financial reward comes in a different way than, say, a private equity where they will be investing in a consolidator, right? Who will go out and buy up all the advice firms and ultimately they're financial investors and they will often take control of that business. They will own control of the consolidator and ultimately the game plan is to sell the business on or exit to the public market in say five to seven years. And then, and, and you know, that broadly applies to family offices as well. They're taking control of an advice business or a consolidator business with the intention of scaling and exiting. They may or may not be interested in, I mean, of course, they, they will be interested in whether you can capture the margins that naturally go to the DFM proposition and maybe some of the margins that, that go into the platform and the fund elements. But but primarily, their goal is to make financial returns through exit, as opposed to uh, you know when a distributor might be buying. Am I am I wrong in that? Well, thinking? well, I I I put a note of caution on the point about distribution. I mean, Aviva buying Succession. Succession is and says it wishes to be, and I believe them independent for the foreseeable future if there are going to be requirements in relation to distribution and how distribution operates that might imply might i don't know that succession might need to become restricted and that's something that aviva would have to weigh up in terms of the pluses and the minuses 
and also you know what's the impact on the attitude of advisors within the business and would they want to remain and if they didn't remain some of them what would be the impact in terms of clients going with the advisors so all yes. of those things has to be thought through so uh, you know i think initially i would see what aviva have done as a diversification play in terms of it's a use of their capital it gives them an insight in the market with a substantial um, consolidator in the form of succession uh, I can't say that their longer term plan isn't to seek distribution from it. I mean, they can certainly, I think what I would say positively is they can bring to bear some of their resources in terms of technology. You know, they might have digital solutions that they can provide for succession to make it more successful and to enhance its returns and its embedded value. But they too, like private equity, might just see it as a play for five or seven years and then sell it on. Yeah, and so, and you've done this before, right? With AXA to an extent, right? You know, they, you sell to these players, and they do say maybe on day one that there isn't going to be, uh, you know, uh, force. They they're not going to force you down the distribution route and all that. So, but it only takes a change of a CEO at the top, over which none of the succession or anyone else has uh, has control. For the direction to change no no you're absolutely right and you know business owners say to us uh, you know it's all very well i'm you're suggesting that you know or it looks like consolidator a or acquirer b looks highly attractive but what happens if the management changes and there are there, there are finite limits to the protection you can deliver you can deliver protection through the fundamental agreement which is the sale and purchase agreement which supersedes everything else and you know, I, I work on a very simplistic basis, I'm not a lawyer, but if it ain't in the sale and purchase agreement, it's not there. It could be said verbally, but if it's not there in writing, it isn't there or you can't rely on it. And even where it's in writing, you've got to be clear what it is. And, and probably in most cases, you can only influence within the SPA what happens during the buyout period so that at least you get to the end of the period on which you're uh, payments are dependent by being able to agree that certain things cannot or should not change unless with your agreement. But after a certain period of time, very few acquirers will allow the vendor to have a, per, you know, to, to, to be able to exercise a permanent uh, influence over what happens uh, to the proposition. And then it becomes a matter of perception and trust in terms of what they believe as a seller. The acquirer is seeking to achieve and what the acquirer can demonstrate and some acquirers can demonstrate a very consistent long-term stable gradualist approach to um, what they do and how they deliver advice and their proposition others have been changed much more often than that and again that comes down to what the vendor the seller is happy with and that's what we listen to at the outset of our relationship with them to ensure we've understood what is an absolute must have or must not have and as i say what's desirable and what's a nice to have and there are finite limits as to what you can achieve and you've got to be realistic because ultimately if you don't like any of that then you're probably moving back to a carrying on as is or looking to let the next generation of management succeed and that may be what you decide to do and you accept in the process that you may get less in a management buyout, say, than you would have got as a sale. That doesn't necessarily follow. Um, and the same applies to an ER. You know, Chris Budd would say you get just as much out of employee ownership trust as you would out of a sale. I mean, you can debate that, and that may be true. But the fact of the matter is that um, what you won't get in, uh, what you get with a sale within a, say, two to three year period is you get certainty of payment. Um, subject, of course, to the buyer being able to fund the payments. And that's another fact that you factor you look at in the due diligence you do i mean it's highly unlikely that vendors can't make the payment but you know it's still something you have to check a have they got the funding and you know it's the first payment that matters because the second and subsequent payments are made out of cash flow but what you don't want to find is they're taking your cash flow to pay for another acquisition uh, so again <laughs> you know, looking into it you're looking into the history i mean you know that that's a very very rare occurrence and it's very yes. rare that people can't make second and subsequent payments. There have been a couple of well-documented examples in the last 10 years, 
but they're very exceptional. Yeah. No, it's it's fascinating, and, and Roderick, you're a fountain of wisdom when it comes to these things, and I can, can talk to you forever, but uh, my producer uh, wouldn't let me. So so let, let's start to wrap this up. We can't have this conversation, though, about m &A without having the conversation about valuation, right? So this is now 2022, right? Uh, we know what's happened with interest rates. We know what's, uh, you know, what's, what that means for cost of capital, for, for acquisitions. What is it you're seeing in the marketplace right now? Is, is, the, is well, that had any impact on, well, the, on the valuation the, of firms? The answer is valuations are holding up for good firms. They always will. Right. Um, but, but if you asked me for uh, a smaller firm, uh, I define a smaller firm. I was doing a, a webinar this morning, actually, for um, CISI, actually, funny enough, Chartered Institute of Securities Investments. And somebody said, well, what do you define as a smaller firm? And I said, well, that's very subjective. But let's say it's somebody that's a one or two person business with assets under 100 million, let's say. And I would have said that if it's a well-run business and decent average size clients and there are no complications with um, DBTs, they've done a few but not too many and they've been well documented and so on. Um, and they've got back, good back office systems, they probably get between three and a half and four times recurring income. And you exceptionally might in the current market get a little bit more than four times, but that would be the exceptional. And what would you get for a slightly larger business that's valued on an EBITDA basis? Um, the answer is probably somewhere between six and eight times, up to probably about half a million of profit or, or, of EBITDA. But then when you get towards a million, you're probably going to get I would argue more than eight, and uh, where you've got more than a million and a half to two million, you can get quite a bit north of ten times. Um, and you know, right. we sold a business earlier this year, and EBIT was about two million, and we got somewhere between twelve and thirteen times. But other factors intervene, not just the EBIT DAR. It's what's the geographic location? Do they bring a specialism to a buyer that the buyer particularly wants? So. Our role is to find a buyer that's not only suitable, but is there at a particular point in time that wants that business because it fills a gap geographically or it fills a gap from a skill set point of view. And that then also helps enhance the valuation. So, but yeah, three and a half to four times for smaller businesses, six to eight for, you know, um, sort of slightly larger and then anything upwards, depending of, you know, what the EBIT is, but north of two million, it's probably well north of 10. It's interesting. Maybe I understand. I, I didn't understand this. So when you were valuing two to three RI firms, you you did that on a multiple of recurring revenue. But it, then it could be it could be one of both. It could be multiple. It could be EBIT. If it's a what what sometimes happens is the consolidator in their own internal. Um, arrangements will do EBIT, but they'll convert it back to a recurring basis because they feel that's what the vendor more readily understands. But EBIT is now the most common overall. But I mean, if it was a book sale, or it was sub 50 million type sale of assets, probably. I mean, I'm, you know, that's a bit of an arbitrary figure. I, I don't know. It, it, it would tend to be recurring income, but anything that's of sort of a, a reasonable scale of sort of 7,500 million upwards would probably mostly be valued on an EBITDA basis because that's the currency in which the um, private equity house uh, work and uh, it's what you know everything gets measured in. They might do what's called a triangulation though just to get and we need to finish by the sounds of it so we need to wrap up <laughs> soon. Uh, we've all got places to go and you know I want to get on board um, uh, that sometimes a triangulation is done where the buyer will say, I value on an EBITDA basis, but I'll test my valuation on a recurring income basis and also on assets under management just to see what if I come out with different numbers and it tells me anything anomalous about the business. Um, because the yes. business has a certain value at the end of the day, and that has to be reflected. And, um, you know, there's only so far you can push valuations. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I... If you assume, if you assume, say, 100 million, just to keep the math simple, if you have, assume, say, two, two women IFA, right, um, 100 million of assets under management, 
one um, percent recurring revenue, um, and and um, you know twenty five percent profit profitability after paying for the for the for the advisor and and you know accounting for that. That's twenty five. That's two hundred and fifty million, right? That's two hundred and fifty million. Sorry, no, two hundred and fifty thousand pounds of earnings. If you multiply that by six, that gets you to uh, three, you know, three million revenue. Sorry, sorry, three million valuation. And I guess that is three times recurring revenue. Is that is that the matter? Well, it is, so... but 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 again, you've got to then get to normalised EBITDA because you're going to want to take out non-recurring costs once the business is sold, but. You right. you are right. You should be able to get some correlation, but I would be surprised if it was as little as three. It would not. I mean, I don't think uh, we've handled a business sale um, for uh, you know niche intermediaries, if I call them that, um, you know, rather than just call them small because there's nothing wrong with being small. Um, uh, that would probably attract less than three and a half to three and a three quarter times recurring um, for a well run That's business. Interesting. So there we are. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Roderick, I have enjoyed this conversation. I have learned so much. Uh, and I've had an opportunity to argue from a point of ignorance. So thank you very much for your time. Not ignorance, just a quest for knowledge. <laughs> Where can we find you for the purpose of the audience? Where can they find you? They want to work with you. They want to learn more. <laughs> www.thecatalystsuk.uk. There's no co. Uh, or rr at thecatalysts.uk. Or they can look up, um, they can find the website. Uh, or I still have a Renison Consulting website if all else fails. And I've got plenty of references there. I've been writing for money marketing articles for about five years. So they can read 30 previous articles if they want, if they really want to be bored stiff about various aspects of MA and practice management. So plenty of ways of getting hold of me, uh, but www um, uh, uh, at the catalyst, um, dot uk gets me or um, rr uh, at the catalyst dot uk and my mobile number's on there. Love to hear from anybody, anytime. Always happy to chat. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Roderick. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thanks now. I'll be remiss if I don't thank my incredible team who worked very hard to put this program together. Thank you, thank you very much guys. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Timeline Retirement Planning Software and Pytech Low Cost Flat Fee Model Portfolio Manager. And to you, our listeners, thank you for your time. I hope you've had as much fun listening to the program as we have making it. You can find more about the show at retirementals.co.uk and you can follow me on twitter my handle is abraham on money until next time thank you and goodbye